And so today I'm going to focus on the different methods that we can use to examine ancient DNA, understand how it degrades, and use those patterns to help us authenticate um, ancient DNA, uh, taxa, particular genomes, and samples, uh, archaeological samples. Um, I'm also going to talk about how this damage, while it's useful for authentication, can cause some downstream difficulties when we try to um, look at uh, phylogenies or do genotyping, and so we'll discuss that in the second half of the lecture. But first, one of the things I want to emphasize is we have come a long way in ancient DNA studies. We can trace the origins of our field way back to 1984 with this first paper by Higuchi and colleagues um, where they studied the ancient DNA from a museum specimen of the extinct equid, the quagga, which is a kind of horse and zebra-like um, animal. What's really amazing to me about this was 1984 was a very different world in terms of uh, our capabilities within biology and genetics. Just to put this a bit into perspective, um, here is the sequence that was first published in this paper. Um, and this took an enormous amount of effort to achieve. I know that it's only a little over 100 bases, and yet this took over a year's worth of lab work to get to the stage to be able to read these very, very first ancient DNA sequences. And all of this work was analog. In fact, many of the tools that you take for granted today didn't exist, hadn't yet been invented in 1984. So just as an example, Microsoft Excel, which is kind of ubiquitous software for uh, basic spreadsheet uh, uh, data manipulation um, wasn't invented until 1985. So this just kind of shows you uh, what a remarkable achievement it was to be able to sequence this quagga DNA in the early 1980s. And really, this is this is in many ways at the beginning of the era of a genome or gene sequencing. You know, how did they actually accomplish the genetic sequencing of this paper? And it's very different than the methods we use today. Uh, the method they used was something called prime synthesis dideoxynucleoside chain termination method, and that was developed by Sanger and colleagues in 1977. And this paper really announced the invention of one of the really the first uh, really successful and useful methods for sequencing DNA. And this was a breakthrough moment, and how it works is really fascinating. So yesterday, James introduced you to some basic concepts of DNA sequencing that we use for next generation sequencing. And in some ways, it's a kind of variant on this original uh, method developed by Sanger in which uh, different uh, nucleotides that have a kind of blocking um, uh, component, so it stops, they were randomly mixed in with the other nucleotides, and you could do an extension of the DNA, putting in the complementary bases and where these randomly uh, would integrate, like the, you would have kind of random integration of these uh, blocking nucleotides, you would end up with different lengths of extension. You could order those all um, by size, and then you could run them out on a gel, and you could look at the different bands, and the bands would tell you what the uh, base was at a particular position in the sequence. And here, uh, at the time, instead of using dyes to be able to determine the sequence, they used uh, radioactivity. So they use radioactive nucleotides um, and then could use a, um, a, a radiographic sensitive film to then visualize this. Now this is from the original Sanger paper. It's a little bit hard to read how they exactly did this, but I want to walk you through it because it's really brilliant. Um, here's another image of a similarly produced sequence, um, but it's a little bit clearer on the gel. And as I mentioned before, this was a completely analog method, and it took a really long time to be able to get to the point of running out this gel and determining the sequence. And this was done really literally with rulers and pencils. So you would look at a particular position. Uh, so here, for example, you see there's a band in the C column because the different nucleotides were not all mixed together, but were separated. So different reactions for each of the four bases. So we can see this is a C. And then the next two positions are both A, and then the next positions are G and T, then another G and T, and so forth. And so this process, so setting aside 
the you know, years worth of laboratory work that it would have taken to be able to get the DNA to the point where you could then have enough of it to be able to analyze, even just doing the sequencing itself would take a full workday to set up these reactions, the extensions, run the gel, develop the film, and then be able to read out the DNA sequences. And remarkably, all of this work took place before the invention of PCR. So when I talk about the extension of the DNA here, this is not using PCR. Um, this was using earlier methods. A PCR wouldn't be developed for a few more years. And contrast that to where we are today, where a single Illumina NovaSeq 6000 run will generate 10 billion sequences of up to 300 base pairs each. So this is an enormous difference from where we came from in the early 80s. And that's why all of you here are here today for a workshop on learning how to code and program and script for genetic data analysis for ancient metagenomics, because our field has changed so much over this period. So initially, the vast majority of the hours of work that went into this analysis was in the laboratory, really just preparing to the point where you could generate the sequence. And that's very different today where the laboratory methods have become quite standardized, but the data output is enormous. So we're really dealing with the deluge of DNA data, and that requires specialized skills to be able to handle that, to be able to process that, and to be able to interpret it. And so how do we go from quagga to ancient microbes. It was an amazing journey. So for the rest of my lecture today and for uh, this week, we're gonna focus on how we use uh, genetic technologies uh, to be able to study ancient microbes. But one of the things I wanna start with is, well, where exactly do we get uh, DNA from ancient microbes? How do you find DNA from these things we can't see? And it turns out there are several really quite reliable sources that have proven to be um, very productive and, uh, and very informative about the past. And while there are more, I'm just going to go over a few of them that are particularly important in archaeology. So by far, perhaps the single greatest source of ancient microbial DNA is teeth. So here you see the mandible or lower jaw of an individual who died about a thousand years ago. And you can see several things that are important here. So first of all, you can see on the surface of the teeth, there are these mineral accretions, which are called dental calculus which are a form of de uh, calcified dental plaque. You can see that the bone beneath it, the alveolar bone in which the teeth sit, um, it's actually quite inflamed and the, um, the bone has recessed. And this is in response to uh, an immunological response to that dental plaque. And so this person had a periodontitis or inflammation of the periodontium or the bone that holds the teeth. And so we see here already some indications that microbes were active during the time of life. We can take a closer look at one of those teeth, and here we see it in cross-section. And there's three main sources of microbial DNA that we can obtain from this tooth. So on the surface of the enamel, which is at the top here colored in white, um, we see that accretion, that mineral accretion, which is dental calculus, again, calcified dental plaque. And within that, if we zoom in, we can see thousands, if not millions, of individual bacterial cells that have been calcified in place. It's like they're frozen in time. And this process, this calcification happens during life, periodically, building up this calcified biofilm. In fact, calculus is the only part of your body that fossilizes while you're still alive. And so what you're looking at here are the calcified remains of the oral microbiome, specifically the bacteria that grow on the surfaces of your teeth. In the second picture here at B, we're looking at a close-up of the pulp chamber of the tooth. Um, during life, the tooth is vascularized. Um, there are uh, blood vessels that run through the root canal and feed the dental pulp, which is at the center of each tooth. And so you are connected, your teeth are connected to the broader um, circulatory system. Um, during life, if you have a bloodborne infac infection, any pathogens that are circulating in your blood will also be circulating through your teeth, through the dental pulp chamber. And if you die while this infection is active, in fact, maybe it's contributing to mortality, then that pathogen, those pathogens will be present in the tooth and will decay in place within the dental pulp chamber, and their DNA will end up being smeared along the outer walls of the dental pulp chamber. And so it turns out that sampling this 
the, the kind of walls of the dental pulp chamber are some of the best uh, sources of obtaining DNA from pathogens that were involved in infectious diseases, bloodborne infectious diseases um, around the time of death. And last in the bottom image there, you see something quite different. You can see that the tooth here um, looks a little bit ragged. There's some discoloration and some degradation of the tooth. And that's because this tooth is actively undergoing decomposition. And you're seeing the activity of the necrobiome or the bacteria that contribute to the decay and decomposition of, of the teeth. Um, in the image you can see there, you see that many, you see many little uh, kind of dark or black points. Um, they're dark in color because they are not mineralized, and they're not mineralized because they're still alive. So you're looking at many living bacteria that are slowly breaking down and decomposing the tooth. Now, one thing that's important to keep in mind about the necrobiome is the necrobiome can also be quite old. Um, bacteria invade the body and start to break it down within hours or days of death. And so some of these bacteria themselves um, are very ancient, or are the descendants of these very ancient bacteria. And so one thing to keep in mind when analyzing the necrobiome is you will see a mixture of DNA, some that may be quite recent, from recent bacteria that have moved in and colonized the tooth, but you might also see some members of the microbiome show uh, uh, indications of great uh, age and DNA damage because they might be from the early phases of decomposition and may be nearly as old as the tooth itself. We can also look to the, the bone itself, and we can look specifically for things like skeletal lesions. Some diseases, especially diseases that are chronic, um, that take place over many months or many years, and in fact, bone will cause characteristic alterations to the bone. They might cause um, a destabilization of the bone. And for example, this is a, from Peru. So this is a very characteristic type of pathology that occurs in tuberculosis where Tuberculosis can escape the lungs and go into the spinal column where it affects, it infects the vertebral bodies. Um, and this destabilizes the strength of the vertebra and can cause them to collapse forward, which is called kyphosis. And that leads to this characteristic kind of hunching of the back that we sometimes see in art and other representations from the past, like this bronze sculpture from Egypt, for example, showing the very characteristic collapse of the spine from tuberculosis, from the action of the mycobacterium tuberculosis infecting and destabilizing the spine. Um, we also see leprosy, for example, can lead to um, changes in the skeleton. Um, it tends to cause uh, a widening of the nasal aperture, destruction of the bone around the dentition, um, and also many alterations of the uh, fingers and toes, and so that can also be recognized um, osteologically in the archaeological record, and you can directly test the bone that's involved and recover DNA from the pathogens that cause that infection, like Mycobacterium tuberculosis or Mycobacterium leprae. We also have more recent specimens, so for example, in many medical collections from the 18th and 19th centuries, there are, for example, pathological specimens from um, medical schools or medical institutions um, that have been stored in alcohol or formalin. These might be examples of diseased liver or other organs. Um, and those can also um, potentially contain patho uh, pathogen DNA. Sometimes you have, um, even from the early 20th century, there's tissue specimens that have been pre uh, prepared with formalin and fixed into blocks um, for looking at histology or microscopic investigation. And you can recover uh, DNA with some effort from this because it's a little bit difficult because the formalin causes DNA crosslinks, but it is possible. And there's also some really interesting work that's been going on looking at things, historic items, like this is a smallpox uh, vaccination kit from the uh, 1800s in the United States, um, and it contained material that was used, uh, actually scabs from healed smallpox pustules that were used for, um, actually at this time, not vaccination, but uh, variolation. So there's different types of uh, material that you can get also from historic context directly related to disease. Um, we also can find uh, uh, ancient microbial DNA in, for example, paleofeces. Uh, paleofeces, 
don't preserve under most circumstances. And that's really a good thing for all of us because if feces never decomposed, you can only imagine what the world would look like today. So we can all be grateful that the overwhelming majority of feces produced in the history of the world is gone. But in some cases it does preserve, for example, in caves, uh, very dry caves or in salt mines, um, there's, or in permafrost or uh, different um, conditions, basically that immobilize water and slow decomposition, you can get preserved paleofeces. Like we have two examples here. This is from a, a salt mine, a Celtic salt mine, uh, dating to the Iron Age in Austria and the Alps. This is from in Mexico. And these are great examples of well-preserved paleofeces. And you can have recover um, DNA from the gut microbiome and also parasites and sometimes even food remains. Uh, like for example, here you see this really great seed and obviously a lot of fibrous material in this one. Um, also, we do find um, uh, microbial um, remains in, in things like uh, uh, pottery or uh, vessels or uh, bowls. Um, uh, so for example, I've been working on a project in Nepal where there is um, a series of tombs that were exposed in an earthquake and in the tombs, uh, there, which are about um, maybe about 1500 years old, um, there were funerary plates and bowls and cups laid out and inside the residues of these bowls and cups we've been analyzing and can recover um, the remains of bacteria that were used to produce some of the foods, including some of the fermented beverages. And then last, we can also get it from sediment. So this can be collected during excavations. Um, there's a lot of work going on using sedimentary DNA to look at, for example, mammalian or plant DNA changes through time through ecology, but you can also look at, to use, look at it, um, examine it to, uh, to look at bacteria from the past as well. So those are some of the main sources that we use to uh, study ancient DNA of bacteria and other microbes in the past. So what makes something ancient? What's, what is ancient DNA as opposed to just other DNA? And what's kind of the cutoff? Well, ancient DNA is any DNA from a non-living source that shows evidence of molecular degradation. And you'll notice this definition doesn't have any particular time cutoff on it. Um, and that's because it's really, ancient DNA is not defined by a fixed age, but rather by its condition. And so, Based on this, lots of different things qualify as being ancient DNA. So something like 100,000-year-old Neanderthal oral microbiome DNA from dental calculus, that would be ancient DNA. But so would 5,000-year-old hepatitis B virus DNA from teeth, or 2,000-year-old gut microbiome DNA from paleofeces, or 600-year-old plague DNA from skeletons, or maybe oral bacteria from 19th-century gorillas in a museum, or pathogen DNA from a 19th century medical specimen, alcohol, or even leprosy DNA from mid 20th century formal and fixed paraffin embedded FFP tissue blocks. Those are all ancient DNA because they all show similar types of DNA damage um, that require special handling to be able to analyze. And so basically ancient DNA is DNA that's undergone specific forms of degradation and damage. All right, so let's take a step back. Why does this really matter? And this matters when you kind of think about it in the context of the genomes we're really trying to understand. So let's go over some genome basics. So we have things like viruses, which have two different types of genomes. You have DNA viruses, whose genomes are made up of DNA, and those that are RNA viruses, they have RNA genomes. They can be single-stranded, double-stranded, partially double-stranded. They can have one single string of DNA, or they can have many. So viruses are very diverse. Bacterial cells are a bit more consistent. You, you have one bacterial, uh, often called a chromosome, um, which is a bit of a misnomer, but one, basically the, the, the genome of the bacterial cell is one long continuous circle that gets all folded up in the center. And then you can also have what are called plasmids, which are smaller circles of DNA. But in bacteria, um, the genomes in general are all circular, whether it's the chromosomal DNA or the plasma DNA. Then you have in animal cells, you have two different types of genomes. You have the nuclear genome, which are actually these long strings, which we call chromosomes. It's just one long, 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 single linear piece of DNA, all coiled up. And we also have in our mitochondria, we have circular DNA. And that is because mitochondria ultimately derive from bacteria 
that entered into other cells at the beginning of the formation of eukaryotes, but it's they have circular DNA because they do have a bacterial origin of you know billion years ago. And then you have plant cells, which are quite similar in many ways to animal cells. You have your nuclear DNA and you have your mitochondrial genomes, but plants also have chloroplasts and other plant um, organelles that also have their own genomes, like the plastid genome, for example which is also circular because it ultimately drives from cyanobacteria, again, a bacterial origin for chloroplasts. All right, so let's take a step back. What are the relative genome sizes of these different types of organisms? So viruses have the smallest genomes and they're, most viruses are about five to 100,000 um, base pairs or kilobase pairs. Bacteria are bigger. Their genome on average is about one to five million base pairs long, one gigantic circle. Animals, bigger yet, animals generally typically have genomes on the order of three to six billion base pairs or giga base pairs. And plants clock in at some of the highest with an average of six to 18 billion base pairs. So you can see that the genome sizes across these different types of organisms is very, very different with microbes having smaller genomes. But even these, this isn't the maximum size you can get. The world's largest known virus, for example, has a genome of 2.5 million bases, which it puts it firmly within the range of bacteria. The world's largest known bacterial genome is 13 million bases long. Animals, it comes in for the lungfish. So the lungfish has a genome of 130 billion bases. And among plants, the largest known genome is this one, Paris japonica, at 149 billion bases. The size of the genome has nothing to do with the complexity of the organism because currently the, the organism with the largest known genome, still a bit controversial, but still holding the record, is actually this little amoeba called Polychaos dubium with an estimated genome size of 670 billion bases long. And so when we're trying to understand these organisms or reconstruct their genomes or understand their functions, um, these genome sizes become really relevant when you consider the kind of short uh, DNA that we have to work with, with ancient DNA. So let's just put this on a little bit of context. So let's take the human genome as an example, because it's what we're most familiar with. Um, the human genome, the haploid size is three gigabase pairs, so three billion bases. We have two, so each one of your cells has six billion bases in it. Um, you have 46 chromosomes, which are 23 pairs. And each one ranges in size between 50 and 250 million base pairs. And remember, chromosomes are really just strings of DNA, really, 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 really long strings. And we also have our little mitogenome, which is so small that if I were to show it on here, you wouldn't be able to see it. And it's very tiny. It's about 16,000 bases long, but you have many, many copies. So you can have over 1,000 copies per cell, depending on the cell type. So if you've ever wondered, um, I always wondered why, you know, how did chromosome one get to be chromosome one? And why is chromosome 12, chromosome 12? Well, they're actually numbered in order of length, or at least the length as they were originally calculated. And so chromosome one is our largest chromosome. It's the longest chromosome, and it's nearly 250 million base pairs long. One giant string, 250 million base pairs long, which is pretty cool. And your shortest ones, so chromosome 21, 22, they clock in at about, like I said, 50 million base pairs long, one continuous long string. But what happens with ancient DNA and what makes it difficult, so let's take this chromosome one as an example, is what ancient DNA is, it breaks that DNA into pieces. So rather than now being just one long string, it's now gonna be many small pieces. And on average, ancient DNA is somewhere on the ballpark of about 50 base pairs long. So if you kind of use a puzzle metaphor, I like to refer to this as the world's worst jigsaw puzzle, because if you had to put together an ancient DNA jigsaw puzzle of chromosome one, it would be a puzzle with over 5 million pieces. So this makes it kind of puts in perspective some of the challenges we have in working with ancient DNA. All right, so what kinds of damage does, can occur? So this is a paper from Mickey Hofreiter's study in 2001, um, before it was really understood what the main forms of damage were. These are all the different places that DNA can be potentially damaged. DNA is quite a vulnerable molecule that can be attacked by many different chemicals from many different angles. But it turns out that 
a few of these uh, bonds are attacked much, much, much more frequently than others through time. So we're going to examine some of those. So what typically happens first in DNA damage is that we get um, uh, depurination. So James introduced that adenines and guanines are called purines. It's a type of base. And what ends up happening um, very quickly when, when an organism dies is you get something called depurination where the purines get attacked and clipped off. And so what this does is that throughout your molecule then, where your A's and G's were, they tend to be um, clipped out and are kind of missing. So you get these kind of holes in your sequence. Once that hole is made, it makes the backbone much more exposed. And this allows then there to be hydrolytic attack of the actual phosphate backbone. And when this happens, you get the backbone is broken where you have the depurination. And this is called nicking. And these nicks occur randomly and they can occur on both sides. So this is called a single stranded nick. And this is a different single stranded nick. Now, once you have those single stranded nicks, um, the only thing holding the DNA together are the hydrogen bonds between the bases. And if the length is not long enough, remember this DNA is never just sitting here. It's always moving and always shaking and always vibrating. These hydrogen bonds will not be enough to hold this piece on and it will shake off. So you have to have a continuous string of attached bases to really hold it together. And so these, where you have these nickings, you will then get these single stranded overhangs where the DNA will kind of peel off and float away. Once you have these single stranded overhangs, it exposes the cytosines that are present in the overhangs. The cytosines, oh, sorry, before we go on, this is when this nicking happens, when these nicks are close together, um, this is what leads to the fragmentation. And this ultimately leads to this kind of distribution we see for ancient DNA. So this is a real uh, some data that we have from dental calculus from different times and places. And you can see that the kind of mode DNA length is around 50, 60 bases long. And it rapidly declines such that by 150 bases and higher, you have almost new, no DNA of that length. Almost everything is shorter. And it has to do with this nicking and kind of melting away or floating away of the, uh, of the fragments that aren't held on tightly enough by the hydrogen bonds of the bases. All right, so this is how DNA gets chopped up into pieces. So next though, as I said, you have the cytosines, they have a very vulnerable position here with their amine group, this nitrogen group here. And so once they're exposed, they're no longer hydrogen bound to a guanine, um, they can be attacked by hydrolytic attack and that nitrogen group is clipped off and that turns them into uracils. And you might remember uracils are not normally found in DNA, uracils are typical of RNA. So this introduces um, uracils into the DNA strand. And this process takes place a thousand times faster or more often in single-stranded DNA than in double-stranded DNA. So we tend to accumulate the uracils only in these uh, single-stranded overhangs of the DNA. And when later on, when we go to analyze this DNA, the polymerase that we use interprets a uracil as a thymine. And that's why we get these characteristic cytosine to thymine transitions in ancient DNA. It has to do with this process of the damage of the cytosines into a uracil, which then the DNA polymerases interpret as a thymine. So that's our characteristic C to T transition that we see in ancient DNA. So the process of DNA damage goes first, depurination, so the random loss of A and G bases, then nicking, so the hydrolytic attack of the phosphate backbone at sites of depurination, then fragmentation, when two nicks on opposite sides are very close together, the hydrogen bonds between the bases aren't strong enough to hold the strands together and they separate or melt, causing fragmentation with single stranded overhangs on either side. And then finally, deamination, where the cytosines on the single stranded overhangs undergo hydrolytic attack and lose their amine group, converting into uracil. And then DNA polymerases read the uracils of thymine, introducing C to T errors in downstream sequences. All right. So basically what happens for microbial genomes is you start out like this, you fragment into a ton of pieces, and at least it's a not quite such a bad problem with microbes because they have smaller genomes. So rather than having a 5 million piece puzzle, 
for a typical bacterial genome, you have something like a 60,000 piece puzzle that you have to kind of put back together. All right, well, how was this figured out? This is really cool. And it was figured out actually relatively recently. So in the pre-NGS era, so before next generation sequencing, it was known that DNA, ancient DNA was fragmented, but it wasn't known what the length distribution was. So as recently as 2004, you can see that it's really not clear at that point how fragmented the DNA was. And that was because prior to the NGS era, there really weren't good methods for precisely measuring the length of very short DNA. Short DNA is very easily lost during DNA extraction, and the amount of DNA that you could get out of an ancient sample was so low you couldn't run it on a gel, and so it was really uncertain just how long or how short ancient DNA was, and so a lot of papers prior to 2007 will give an estimate, which is really just a kind of guess, of around 100 to 500 base pairs. You'll see that over and over again in lots of literature, and it's really because they couldn't measure it. They could tell it was short, but they didn't know how short. Um, a lot of early studies which used a targeted PCR approach um, would try to amplify templates of about 300 to 500 base pairs long, but they had a very high PCR failure rate um, and really vexing contamination problems. And we now know why, because it turns out ancient DNA is much shorter than this, but at the time they didn't know. And so when you don't have DNA long enough to do this sort of amplification, you preferentially amplify uh, traces of contamination that might be present. So this early era is really um, plagued by these kinds of, of issues. And it was also known for some time that there was an excess of C to T but also G to A miscoding lesions in ancient DNA. But that damage process was not well understood. So as a, in a review as recently as 2003, Tom Gilbert and colleagues pointed to this, but they couldn't really explain the mechanisms of how it got there. And so at this point in the pre-NGS era, damage was just seen as a problem for the ancient DNA community. There was no benefit at all recognized in it. And this all changed in the next generation sequencing era because with this kind of radical redesign of sequencing, suddenly we didn't have to have PCR priming sites on the actual DNA template, which meant we could work with much shorter amounts of DNA. Instead, we just ligated or stuck our own priming sites to the ends of the molecules. And this made it possible for the first time to recover all of the ancient DNA in a sample and to measure the true size of the ancient DNA. And once this could be done, then the order of damage processes could be determined and the process of DNA degradation could be defined, which was first done in 2007 in a paper by Adrian Briggs and colleagues, which was done here at the Max Planck on the Neanderthal genome, which we'll talk about more in a minute. Um, and then later there were really improved extraction methods that could get much more, but greater recovery of the very short fragments. Um, this is uh, by Jesse Dabney and all, again done here at the MPI, and that revealed that ancient DNA actually is very, very short, and a lot of our early extraction methods simply couldn't hold on to these tiny fragments um, and only retained the largest molecules, which kind of gave it a bias or skewed our perception of how long ancient DNA was. It turns out it's very short. So most ancient DNA we now know is on average of about 30 to 50 bases long. And, but because we were able to put all of this together, and because we realized that, the, that DNA damage is quite predictable, DNA damage actually became a solution to authenticating DNA. And now there are a number of tools that actually specifically look for and use this damage as a way of authenticating DNA and distinguishing it from modern DNA. And this was really critical for some of the Neanderthal genome sequencing and is even used today um, for samples of all ages, uh, depending on context, to separate ancient and modern DNA and to authenticate good samples. So this is this paper I mentioned. Um, it was really determined on Neanderthals, and there were these patterns that were noticed. So this is a, a, a graph here. If you imagine this internal part is the ancient DNA molecule, and this line represents where the molecule ends. And um, what, what would have been on the outside of that sequence. And what they realized was that there was an excess of purines just beyond what you recovered from the ancient DNA. So the ancient DNA always seemed to fragment right next to a purine. 
Um, and that was one of the first clues that depurination was a major um, component of DNA uh, degradation. Um, and then another thing that was observed was that if you looked again at the ancient DNA fragment from both ends, from the five prime end and from the three prime end, you would get an excess of errors or um, differences from the reference sequence at the very ends. So an excess of C's on the five prime end and an excess of G's or sorry, I have a, so an excess of T's on the five prime end and an excess of A's on the three prime end. And this was related again to the damage that occurred on these single stranded overhangs. And this was nicknamed the smile plot because you can see it kind of looks like a giant smile. All right. And so this is your kind of tip, your typical smile plot. And it's caused again by the randomness of the nicking, which causes the overhangs cytosine deaminating a thousand times faster when on the overhang and critically the asymmetric behavior of repair enzymes during the blunt end library construction which we'll talk about now and this is really important to understand because right now we've talked about how we have cytosine deamination to make uracils but why do you see this g to a we haven't talked about that at all so what's going on on this other side of the plot we'll explain that it's really important to understand that dna has an orientation a five to three orientation so, and that just has to do with the five and three is, it the, is the count of the carbon. So if we start here on the, uh, the sugar of, uh, of the nucleotide, we have carbon one, two, three, four, five. So if this is the end of your DNA, if you have the exposed five carbon, that's the five prime end. And on the other end of your DNA, we have one, two, three. The end of the DNA is on the three carbons. So that's our three prime end. And so DNA is complementary, it runs five to three, and then on the reverse strand, backwards five to three. And this is really important. So DNA has an orientation. And this is important because a lot of enzymes only work in one direction of the orientation. So the ends, for the enzyme, it matters very much which side is five prime and which side is three prime. All right, so let's take our ancient DNA here. And we have um, our different damaged molecules, and there's just different ways it can be damaged. You could get two nicks on the same strand, leaving the overhangs on both sides on one molecule. You can have nicks on either strands, leading to overhangs one on each side here, or it can be like this, or it can be like this. So here we have a five prime overhang and a three prime overhang. Here we have two five prime overhangs. Here we have two three prime overhangs. And here we have a five and a three. So these are the, all the kind of different ways that you could get the breakage of the DNA. And here I've just put a uracil on each single stranded overhang. Now the first step of a next generation sequencing library construction is to repair the DNA to make the strands fully double stranded with blunt ends. That's what we have to do in order to um, ligate on our adapters so that it's readable by the instrument. So we have to repair this DNA and we use T4 polymerase, a type of uh, polymerase that comes from the T4 virus, um, to do this. But T4 polymerase has some really important properties um, that you need to know about to understand then how it's going to affect sequences downstream. What T4 polymerase does is it will cut off any three prime overhangs and it will fill in any five prime overhangs. So let's take a look. So it will cut off the three prime overhangs. All the three primes are gone and it will fill in the five prime overhangs. Oh, whoops. But filling in those five prime overhangs. When it fills in the five, it puts the complement opposite the uracil, which as I said, T4 will recognize this as a T. And so it puts in the corresponding A. So now we have all blunt ended, double stranded DNA, but we have lost some of our damage, which was clipped off of the three prime end. And now the new three prime ends have whatever was on the five prime, the complement. So now we have these A's. And later, when you go to sequence these, many steps later, you melt the strands and they get reoriented all in the same direction for sequencing. What you'll see is on the five prime end, you have all the year use. And on your three prime end, you have all the A's, which were the complements of those use. Okay. The only damage that actually occurred was cytosine to thymine transitions or cytosine to uracil, which gets read as a thymine. 
But because of T4 polymerase, you only see the five prime T's in the data and the A's are just the complement. And so that's why you get all the C to T's on this side, on the five prime end of the plot, and all your G to A's on the three prime end of the plot. But this A is really a bit of a, um, an artifact of just the complement of the other side of the molecule. And so a fun fact here, because damage typically only occurs on the single-stranded overhangs, the misincorporation rate can never actually reach one. So here you see that in this particular one, 20% of the DNA strands have damage on the first cytosine. It can actually never be 100%. And the maximum rate you can ever achieve under normal circumstances is 50%. All right, so taking this into account, there's been a lot of tools that actually will use this predictable behavior then to authenticate your DNA. And so the first one that was really developed as a tool that people could use was this uh, was map damage, which was later updated to map damage 2.0. Um, uh, and this came out of Ludovic Orlando's group. And here's a plot from this where you can see, um, we can look at the depurination, so the enrichment. Of, uh, of the depurination of, of A's and G's just outside of your DNA. And uh, you can see this kind of characteristic smile plot here. Uh, the same principles were incorporated into PMD tools, um, which was developed by Pontus Skoglin, which is, um, has been used to um, try to separate contaminating and, and ancient DNA that's in a mixture. And uh, for this course, we're actually going to use Damage Profiler, which is very similar to map damage, but it runs much faster. So just looking at computer runtime dam uh, damage profiler um, is um, a little bit more computationally efficient. So that's something that we've incorporated into a lot of our tools, but it basically does the same thing, helping you to characterize these damage rates. So we can take a look at these and by looking at these plots from our ancient samples, we can get a, a rough gauge of how good our sample is or how much ancient DNA we've recovered. So if your plot looks something like this, this is what a not ancient DNA sample looks like. So this is what modern DNA looks like or contamination. Whereas if you have a real ancient DNA sample, you should see this characteristic smile pattern um, indicating that you have damage and it really is truly ancient deg degraded DNA. Now, you'll also see a couple of artifacts sometimes. Um, uh, and these are kind of things you will see. If you get a damage plot like this, don't panic, it's this spiky pattern. That happens when you don't have enough DNA to actually run the, uh, the analysis. So you typically need at least a thousand different unique DNA uh, sequences in order to uh, generate a statistically valid map damage plot or a damage plot. And if you have less, you will get this spiky pattern. So you just need to sequence more. Um, you sometimes will also see this other thing. We have an elevated baseline where it looks great, but it's like everything is high. Um, this is this happens when, especially with microbial DNA, where you don't have the correct reference genome. So let's say it is the actual bacteria is Streptococcus sanguinis, but you don't have that genome. So you map it to Streptococcus mitis, which is a close relative. Um, it's close enough that you can get a good damage plot, but this elevated baseline lets you know that it's not really the right genome. It's actually something related but different. And that happens a lot with ancient bacteria because oftentimes the reference genomes that we have available are not exactly the same as the ones that we're analyzing um, in the past. So this might make you wonder, can we use DNA damage as a clock? Because that would be pretty cool. And the answer is, well, sort of, but not really. It's more like a clock that just says today or a while ago. And so here's some examples of this. So this relationship to time and DNA damage is not linear. And it's also really dependent on local temperature and humidity, which speed up or slow down these processes of hydrolytic attack and depurination and other factors. So all of that will speed up and slow down the damage processes in a way that is very actually quite difficult to predict. So here's some examples of some real data. This comes from Pontus Skoglin's work, where you can see in the Neanderthal samples here that are 40,000 years old, they have about a 45% terminal damage rate. But even you know the Neolithic Scandinavians, they're up at about 35, so they're still pretty high. Um, and you can see though the modern DNA um, uh, is is much um, lower. 
Um, but then you can also see, so our Neanderthals here at 40,000 years, clocking it at 45%. Um, but we have also analyzed some samples from Costa Rica, which is obviously much hotter and much more humid. These are only about 1,000 years old, and yet they have 50% damage. So again, the amount of damage is not directly related to time. Um, it does accumulate with time, but it's heavily, heavily affected by temperature and humidity, which will speed up those processes. So you can't use it as a kind of simple clock. Um, also, another thing to keep in mind is that not all organisms undergo DNA degradation at the same rate, even if they're in the same sample. So this is a, an example of the damage patterns for, this is potatoes, and this is for Physoloptera infestans, which is a pathogen that infects potatoes. And so the potato DNA and the pathogen DNA were obtained from the exact same sample. And here you can see they're actually degrading at the same rate. So there's a one-to-one -one linear relationship between DNA damage in this uh, Physoloptera, Physoloptera infestans and the potato. But we don't always see that. So here's another example of a human and Yersinia, infected with Yersinia pestis. And you can see that the Yersinia pestis is actually de is degrading at a faster rate um, than the humans. Whereas we can also look in calculus at two oral species, so a streptococcus and a methanobrevibacter, and we see that the streptococcus is actually degrading at a faster rate than the methanobrevibacter. This is likely to do with the fact that the methanobrevibacter is an archaeon. Um, it's not bacteria, it's an archaea, and they have a different cell wall structure, and it might have a slower decay rate. We've also looked to see if there's any relationship between methanobrevibacter and, say, humans in the same sample, and we find almost no relationship. So, so the different organisms can also decay at different rates, even within the same sample. So it's really a, a relative indicator, a, a not really an absolute indicator of time. All right. So we talked about damage and how it's useful, and it is very useful, but sometimes you don't want the damage. Sometimes the damage interferes with the analysis you want to do. And so there are ways of removing it. So damage is useful for authenticating that your DNA is ancient, but once you've done that, you don't really want the damage anymore. You just want the sequences. And so especially if you're trying to do sensitive genotyping or tree building analysis, you really want high base calling accuracy, and that will be a problem if you have a lot of damage in your sequences. So fortunately, there's some great ways that you can remove the damage. The one that is widely used, and it was also, again, um, developed here at the um, MPI, EVA, is you can use a, an enzyme cocktail called USER, which actually is just a mix of two enzymes, uracil DNA glycosylase, which is called UDG, and endonuclease uh, 8, um, and you can add this and it cuts off the damage. So what it basically does is it goes and the UDG clips out the uracil, leaving an A basic site. And then endonuclease 8 goes and cuts it where that A basic site is. And now you've removed all the damage from your molecule. So it clips out uracil base, leaving an A basic site. And then it, the endo 8 clips out uh, the DNA up to the A-basic site, and it basically just shortens your molecule, but it removes all of the damage. And then you add T4 polymerase, you cut off the three prime overhang, and you fill in the five prime overhang, and now you have your double strand of DNA that now contains no damage. Um, if you were to take this and now do something like a map damage or a damage profiler plot, you would, it would look like this. The DNA will have no damage, but it will be a little bit shorter than it was in the beginning because you've clipped it off. There's another technique you can do. So sometimes you don't really want to remove all of the damage. So maybe you want to remove almost all of the damage to prove your sequency, but leave just damage base at the end that you can use for authentication. Because if you know there's only one damage base, you can easily computationally go back using your bioinformatic tools and just, uh, you know, in the computer, clip off those bases or mask them. So what if you could have one library where you could both do authentication and you could have high sequencing accuracy? Can you have your cake and eat it too? Yes. And you can do this with another protocol that was developed by Nadine Rowland, um, what's called the partial UDG protocol, or we often call it the UDG half protocol. It's a variation of the user enzyme implementation, 
where it cuts off almost all of the damage, but it just leaves one uracil on each end. Um, and so you have high sequence fidelity, but also can do authentication. But it's important to know that if you do this, the resulting damage plot, it looks like this. It's very easy to see because instead of having that nice curve, it's just a sharp drop. It goes from high to low, just straight down and then flat. So this is a typical UDG half damage plot. But the damage that you see will always be lower than in a non-treated uh, sample. And I'll let you think about it if you can think why that might be, and we'll come back to it during the question and answer session. All right. So everything we've talked about up until this point is valid for DNA sequences that are generated from double-stranded DNA libraries of the type, for example, um, using the protocol that was first developed by um, uh, Matthias Meyer and Martin Kircher in 2010. And so, um, but sometimes you, you can also do it a bit differently. You can build your libraries using what's called a single strain of DNA library construction protocol, which was developed in 2013 and then refined again in 2019. What this protocol does is it allows you to not clip the three prime overhangs. So you get to keep all of your original damage and the benefit of this protocol is it is more efficient at recovering more of the ancient DNA. It's also a much harder protocol to implement in the lab, but it does allow you to recover more DNA. And because you don't clip off the three prime ends, you retain all of your original damage on both sides of the molecule. So you don't get that A, you get just the U's. And so if you have a single stranded library and you look at a damage plot for it, it will look a bit different because it'll be C to T on both sides. So this type of plot is only seen when you do a single stranded library build. So let's do a damage wrap up here. So these are some potential damage plots you could see. So the first one is completely flat. So this would be a modern sample or a UDG treated sample. The second one means you, this kind of spiky profile means you do not have enough DNA to actually make an accurate damage plot. You would need more sequences in order to, to actually evaluate the damage for that sample. This third part looks pretty good, except it has an elevated baseline. So you might want to try repeating the analysis, aligning to a closer reference genome. This one is a characteristic damage plot. If you have a UDG half treatment treated sample, this one, which has C to T on both sides, looks like a single-stranded library. And here is your typical double-stranded DNA library with your C to T and your G to A. These are the kinds of damage plots you might see. All right, so really quickly, I just want to have a little bit of an enzyme alert. This is pretty important. So as we discussed, uracil is not a normal component of DNA. It's typical of RNA. And so far, we've talked about how enzymes like T4 polymerase treat uracil like a thymine. And this is how you get this introduction of the C to T misincorporations. But not all enzymes do this. And this is really critical to know when you're designing your lab work. So some enzymes just stop when they encounter a uracil. So the damage present in ancient DNA this fragmentation and deamination requires the use of specialized library protocols specifically for ancient DNA. Because if you just try to use a modern DNA protocol, they may incorporate enzymes that have the stopping function, which will make your libraries fail or skew towards contamination because it will systematically remove any damaged reads from your libraries and therefore your sequencing. So watch out for this. So there are two types of DNA polymerases. There's what are called non-proofreading, and those are the ones that treat a uracil like a thymine. And there's ones that are called proofreading. These stop at uracils. For ancient DNA, it's critical that you use a non-proofreading enzyme for library construction and the indexing PCR in order to lock in that damage by turning your uracils into a thymine. Later on, you can use your proofreading polymerase once you've turned it into a thymine, but not before. And if you're using a proofreading enzyme for library construction, your, ancient, your damaged ancient DNA molecules will not be sequenced. You should know that, which could bias your data set towards contamination. However, 
if you've UDG treated your ancient DNA, removing the damage, then it is compatible with these proofreading enzymes because there's no more DNA damage in there. So why would you even use proofreading enzymes at all? And it's because they're more accurate. So we use the proofreading enzymes for every step except for those two critical steps in which you're um, working with the uracils. So when the polymerase is encountering the original damaged cytosines, these uracils, that's when you use the non-proofreading T4 polymerase for DNA repair. And you use a non-proofreading uh, polymerase, something like PFU Turbo CX for the library indexing ampl uh, amplification. After this, all of those uracil uracils are converted into thymines, and then it's just like normal DNA. And from that point on, you can use regular proofreading enzymes for all your amplifications, reamplifications, reconditioning steps. Um, we, for example, use Hercules II for that. So that's something to keep in mind. If you have any questions about the protocols and the enzymes that we recommend, we put all of this up on protocols.io. Uh, there you see a lovely picture of James who coordinated this, this effort. Um, and you can see all the enzymes we use at each step. And these are, you can print these out. These are benchtop protocols with checklists that you can have right next to you as you're doing your work, as you proceed through the, um, the lab work. All right. So let's kind of wrap this up. Let's take the big picture. Why does DNA damage matter? Well, DNA damage is very useful because it allows you to authenticate your DNA. It can allow you to authenticate individual species. So maybe you have your Yersinia pestis. You look for damage. You can show it's damage. You can show this is ancient. This is not a contaminant. It allows you to authenticate metagenomic assemblies. Um, you can look at, um, for example, uh, DNA in a, in a community, like in say a coprolite or paleofeces and say, yes, the DNA in this paleofeces is truly ancient. It's not just modern soil contaminants. And it can also allow you to authenticate individual reads for genotype calling, for example, for the human genome. If you're trying to look at particular, uh, in a particular allele with a really important phenotypic feature, you can use uh, DNA damage to authenticate even individual DNA sequences. But DNA damage does pose some major taxonomic challenges for things like the taxonomic identification of sequences, the accurate mapping of genomes, and metagenomic assembly. And it turns out that actually the biggest challenge for us in ancient metagenomics is not the cytosine to um, thymine transitions, it's not the, the deamination of the cytosine. That's actually fairly um, easy to account for but it's the fragmentation. It's the fact that we have very short DNA that makes all of our work very difficult. And that affects it in many ways. So um, it affects our ability to identify, to taxonomically identify our sequences because DNA fragments that are less than 30 bases long lack sufficient specificity for taxonomic assignment. They align to too many genomes with no phylogenetic coherence once they're shorter than 30 bases. And so you may have heard there's a big paper that came out last year by Luva Dahlin and his group. It's really exciting where they have the oldest um, authentic DNA ever sequenced comes from a million year old mammoth, super cool. And we talk about how there's the million year limit of ancient DNA. We, we do not expect to ever be able to recover DNA older than a million years, but it's a little bit confusing because what, what does the DNA limit mean? It's not how long DNA survives. DNA survives a really long time. We know there's DNA that's billions of years old. The problem is, is that it's very short. It's dinucleotides, trinucleotides, that's too tiny for us to say anything meaningful about that DNA. So the million year limit of ancient DNA is not how long DNA survives, but how long DNA sequences greater than 30 base pairs survive, because that's the only DNA from which we can derive information. DNA damage also affects our ability to have accurate genome mapping. So DNA sequences that are less than 100 base pairs often lack taxonomic specificity within clades. And this can lead to cross mapping within groups of related microbial taxa. So when there are insufficient reference genomes for a given species or a genus, these short sequences can easily be misassigned to the wrong strain or the wrong species because they're close enough but they're not from that uh, exact organism. And that just has to do with our, our reads are short. They're not long enough to get really a unique specificity. And this can cause big problems for genotyping 
building phylogenies and inferring evolutionary histories if you're accidentally assigning the wrong a, a sequence to the wrong genome. It can make it look like there's genomic variation there that actually is from another species. And it also affects our ability to do metagenomic assembly because DNA sequences that are less than 250 bases long are really challenging to assemble de novo. They result in many short contexts because the reads aren't long enough to span repetitive elements. So bacterial genomes are full of repetitive elements and things like transposons where you have uh, repeat elements, maybe AT, 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 AT. And if it goes on long enough, you can't bridge across it because that repetitive element may be longer than your ancient DNA is. And that can make it hard or impossible to put your DNA uh, context in order. And many assemblers as a default option automatically discard all the short sequences. So always check your default settings so that you don't, so the first step of your de novo assembly is not to throw away all of your ancient DNA. You can usually change that setting. So just keep in mind. Um, and metagenome, metagenome assembled genomes, they are possible. And we are doing a lot of work on this and you'll hear from Alexander Hubner later this week, work, uh, later this week, he's been doing a lot of work on this and really improving and optimizing assemblers to work well with ancient DNA, and he's had tremendous success. It is possible, but it really requires pipelines that are fine-tuned for ancient DNA. So just as a final recap, ancient DNA has changed enormously since its beginnings in the 1980s. Gone are the days of radiographic films and rulers for ancient DNA sequencing, and we now have machines capable of churning out two, 10 billion sequences at a time. And this means archaeogeneticists like you have to learn how to code and how to script. Genomes are big, but they fragment into thousands or millions of pieces once an organism dies. And the shortness of the DNA fragments with like a mode of about 30 to 50 base pairs and a max of 150 base pairs at the far end of the tail makes taxonomic identification, genome mapping, and metagenomic assembly hard. Ancient DNA accumulates damage, and we can characterize fragmentation and cytosine deamination as indicators of authenticity, but not a precise age. And ancient DNA requires specialized laboratory and uh, library protocols in order to handle that DNA damage. But we now have options to remove the damage using UDG, or we can, can recover even more damage using single-stranded DNA library protocols, depending on your application. And DNA fragmentation is our biggest challenge in ancient metagenomics. So with that, I'll stop here and I'll open it up for questions. And I will stop screen sharing. Oh, before I do, really quick, um, we'll make this available on the website, but I've also put it here um, on these next couple of slides. But if you want to read more, I have a little bibliography for the talk. And so you can go back and look at the different articles um, that I referenced in the talk. So feel free to refer back to this if you want to read the original articles that I mentioned during today's lecture. All right, so the question from the chat from Dario is, let's see, so can the UDG treatment lead to even shorter, less than, yes, it will. Because it, it cuts off the damage. So um, it will go in as far as the damage goes. So it will make your library shorter and that can lead to greater DNA loss. I think Nora, is that Nora has her hand up? Feel free to walk up to the podium and ask it or put it in the chat, either one. Okay. Um, I, I am not sure if I have like a specific question, but I was thinking about the, uh, the user treatment and, um, and how to... Um, how to like balance it and I hadn't heard about the half you did it before, which was super interesting. But 
because I find it like difficult having transitioned over to to metagenomics that I I have no idea what's contamination and what's actually uh, ancient material. Um, but would would you recommend like either doing the half UDG thing or to maybe do two uh, sequences in processes where you do like one with and one without just to make sure that you actually have the ancient. Yeah, uh, that's, a, that's a great cycles. question. We've, 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 we've tried like every combination of this in our work. So um, you should definitely do at least a screening with the full damage so that you can see that you have damage, right? And you really should see it. So um, you, when you, I should say, when you characterize the damage, you do that by aligning your reads to some sort of reference genome. And um, so people often will pick a couple of taxa of interest. So we might pick a species in the oral cavity, maybe Tanarella forsythia, if we're doing the oral microbiome, or pick your Senia pestis if you're working with pathogens. And um, you align to it and you look for the mismatches, and this is where you see these, these characteristic transitions. Um, you can also, there's another way of doing it where you can, you can actually assemble your data if it's deep enough, and then you can align the reads back to the consensus sequence, and that gets around that problem of not having the right reference genome, which is actually a really cool trick, but you have to have a lot of data to do that. But I do recommend that you always at least have at least one genetic data set with either full damage or the UDG half so that you can really see that if you have an organism that's interesting, that it is ancient. Because some of these taxa can be ambiguous and it's not it's not obvious whether or not they would be ancient or modern contamination. And so the damage is really gonna be what helps you. Then you can decide then what your downstream applications are. We, um, for the most part, we'll just work with the full damage sequences because if you have enough sequencing depth, um, you can kind of get around the damage problem because if you cover that same base, you know, six times, it's very clear what the damage is and what the original sequence is. So you can just work with the original data set or you could do um, build a second library, of course, that uses more sample. You could build a second library that is UDG treated to have like a really clean um, sequence, but just keep in, I, you know, I would then only analyze taxa that you've already confirmed do have damage using your undamaged reads. And of course the kind of meat in the middle, which saves you time and money and sample is to do the UDG half treatment. And so you can certainly do that. And, and that has a lot of advantages. We use that for a lot. Um, we often use that especially for any kind of like human genome work um, because with one library, you kind of get it all. So you can see that it's damaged, but you it's only on the first base. So that's very easy to clip off programmatically and then you don't have to worry about it later on. So it's really up to you. And it kind of has to do with what your budget is and what your application is, how you want to do it, if that makes sense. But I would always at least build one library that has some of the damage so that you can really you can really see. And I'll talk about this again tomorrow during the ancient metagenomics uh, section. But um, one thing that will happen sometimes members of your necrobiome, so their postmortem bacteria, will have a lot of damage on them. And that happens because, of course, you know the decomposition process starts immediately. So some of those decomposing bacteria are as old as the skeleton. They could be 14,000 years old themselves. So sometimes you find these really clearly environmental taxa with high amounts of damage, and that's because they are ancient. They are just probably from immediately after death. And you can show That's that. also something I've been considering a lot, like how, and also if you're using, if, if the sample is 10,000 years old, but the con contaminant is 5,000 years old, how would you separate them? And that's tricky because it's not exactly clock-like, right? So sometimes yeah. you can see that, sometimes you can see it. Sometimes you can see that you're, you can take a panel of bacteria that you do expect to find that you know should be there and should be authentic because they're part of the oral microbiome. And then you can see some of the necrobiome members, they might have half the damage or quarter the damage. And that kind of gives you a sense that they come in later but many of them have just as much damage as the, the oral microbiome. And that's because they're probably, you know, they probably entered into the skeleton within a few weeks of death. So there's just really no way to disentangle that using, so you're gonna have to use more of an ecological model 
to, to help with that question. Yeah. Um, Thanks. I, sure. I think Anand had a, or was it, Laura is next. So if you cut the damage, how do you know that it is ancient DNA or do you use both protocols? So good question, Laura. So if you cut the DNA, if you use UDG, you don't know. So that's why you either have to also run a second library with full damage so that you can say, okay, I see with full damage that my Yersinia pestis has um, a damage profile. Now I do UDG. Now I have Yersinia pestis again. It has no damage. But because I know it had damage when I didn't use UDG, I'm just going to treat it as ancient. Or you do the UDG half protocol, and that allows you to kind of have a little bit of the best of both worlds. You can do either one. Does that answer your question? Yeah? OK. Um, next up, we have Anand. Uh, and Anand asks, is, is it known how much time is required for the introduction of those uracils in ancient DNA fragments? Oh, Anand, I wish I knew. Um, I don't know. It can happen very fast. Um, we have seen it happen in material from the 1970s. Um, so, for example, we have chimpanzee, uh, chimpanzees who died in 1977 in Uganda that were buried and then later dug up for, for a skeletal collection, and they have, they have d ancient DNA damage patterns. So it can happen very quickly. It's really just part of this decomposition process. Um, but it happens more quickly in areas that are warm, have higher temperature, have higher humidity. So um, really, the, the, the conditions under which DNA degrades the fastest is uh, high temperature and fluctuating humidity. That's when you get the most damage, uh, the most rapid damage accumulated. And the colder it is, the more stable it is, the drier it is, the slower that process is. But it can happen quite quickly. Uh, next, we have Maria. Let's see. How much does actually the cell wall or cell membrane degrade in the bone tissue? And how much of the damage depends on outside damage versus in inner death processes? Um, so we've looked a lot at whether or not there are DNA damage differences, say, between gram-positive and gram-negative cells. And we do not see any influence of the peptidoglycan wall on the, um, the rates of damage. But if you do look at an oral microbiome sample, for example, and you look at the damage patterns across many bacteria, they do vary by species. And we don't really know why. It's not necessarily related to... Um, the cell wall. Um, it is related to some degree to the GC content, because remember I said that really critical step of fragmentation happens when the DNA molecules separate and cause those single-stranded overhangs. Um, the bonds between Gs and Cs, there's three hydrogen bonds, so they're stronger, and there's only two hydrogen bonds between As and Ts. So GC, really GC-rich DNA will actually hold together longer than an AT-rich genome. So it will kind of, it will fragment more slowly. So the GC content does have an impact a bit on the, on the fragmentation rate, but um, we don't see a really strong um, relationship with, um, with cell wall structure. That being said, we did see that archaea do seem to have a Slightly, or at least from one of our tests, seem to seem to have a slightly slower um, degradation rate. But I think really more would need to be done to really understand that because there's really only one group of archaea in the oral cavity. That's the Methanobrevibacter group, and so that's not very much diversity to really assess that. So it could have just it could just be kind of random that it had a slower um, rate. And in terms of the breakdown, so um, you know lots of things are happening too. These are some of the chemical processes that break down DNA, but of course, once an organism dies um, and their regulation of their own enzymes becomes dysregulated, cells contain lots of things like nucleases and other chemicals that then spill out of um, their containers, and they can also contribute, contribute to DNA decay. One of the things that we see, which is pretty interesting in dental calculus, is which is the oral biofilm, there's often a strong immune response 
happening at the site of the dental plaque, dental calculus, because it's a lot of bacteria, the body responds. And we do see some kind of interesting interactions there. So um, it's really cool. You should totally Google something called netosis, which is part of your innate immune system where your neutrophil cells will actually dissolve their cell, uh, their nuclear membrane, and they attach these cell killing compounds to their own DNA. And then they explode and they kind of splat the DNA over the surface of the plaque um, to try to hold these cell killing compounds up against the dental biofilm. Um, and this can really damage the human DNA that, that is part of this process. And in addition, the bacterial cells themselves express uh, DNA uh, nucleases on their surface that chop up the DNA. So one thing we consistently see is that within dental calculus, where you find both microbial DNA and human DNA, the human DNA is almost always uh, more fragmented than the microbial DNA. And we think it has to do with this really destructive immune process by which human DNA becomes incorporated into dental calculus. I hope that answered your question, Maria. Did you have another question or? Okay. And of course, you know, we talked about the necrobiome. The necrobiome is eating. It's like literally <laughs> eating your DNA away too. So they're actively breaking it down and trying to consume it as a, as a food. So um, there's a lot happening. Uh, next up we have Alice. Alice asks, what is the reason that depurination happens first in degradation? Is it their position orientation, the DNA strands or something else? That's a great question. Um, the, the purines are just more um, vulnerable to chemical attack. And that is the main reason why those occur um, first. In terms of um, the position or the orientation, I don't know. Um, it's a good question. Um, I'd have to look into it a bit more, but the, the purines are just much more chemically vulnerable than the um, pyrimidines, which is why they are the site of the, the first attack. And once they're clipped out, they destabilize that backbone, which is really what opens up the DNA to further chemical attack. So that's kind of the weakest point in the DNA. And then Johnny asks, how do spirits or formalin um, preserved museum specimens compare a damage or degradation wide to, um, to other environmental damage. So formalin is something that um, is particularly challenging to work with because it causes something called cross links. And this is where parts of the DNA will chemically bind to other parts of the DNA and that will shut down the polymerases. So um, formalin is very challenging to work with. However, um, if you do a single stranded library prep that will really help. So um, if you're trying to do work with formalin fixed tissues or formalin um, embedded tissues, I would not recommend a double stranded library prep, the standard one, those tend to really fail and not work well. They cannot overcome the cross links and you'll just have um, very few successful, very few molecules will successfully build into a library. But if you do a single stranded library prep because it, it functions differently, um, you will get a higher success rate of building your library. And that is the main way people have tried to overcome formalin fixed specimens. So I would recommend that. In terms of the alcohol, um, from what I've seen, the preservation is usually very poor and the biomass is low. And I think that is because, um, unfortunately, they didn't just put the specimen in alcohol and leave it. Um, over time, many of the curators at these medical collections would actually decant off the alcohol and put in fresh alcohol. And so I think what was happening, I mean, alcohol actually preserves DNA really well, but I think what was happening is over time, the, the DNA was coming out into the alcohol and then they would dump it and put fresh alcohol in. And so they just kept losing that DNA. So at the end of the day, the, when, you, when you kind of work with them today, they tend to have pretty low DNA content um, as a result of how they've been handled over time. And sometimes they change the chemistry over time too, and they often don't keep records. Okay, that was the last question. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.